All right, if you'll take your Bibles again, and we're going to return to Genesis chapter 1. Genesis chapter 1, and we're going to be rereading some verses that we read last week as a, the uh, core passage from which we're going to speak again this week. Uh, Genesis 1, and follow as I read, starting at verse 26. Then God said, Let us make man in our image, according to our likeness, and let them rule over the fish of the sea, and over the birds of the sky, and over the cattle, and over all the earth, and over all creeping things that creeps on the earth. And God created man in his image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. And God blessed them. And God said to them, Be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth and subdue it and rule over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the sky and over every living thing that moves on the earth. <clears throat> All right, how many of you today are copies of God? Copies of God? Raise your hand. Yes, we learned last week that to be made in God's image means that you are a copy of God. That's what it means. Not a perfect Exact likeness of God, that's not what the Hebrew word means. It means a similar likeness. You are made, and I am made, and everyone you've ever met has been made as a similar copy to God. And last week we looked at what exactly that means, what similar way are we like God. Number one, we said, and this is in your insert for way of review, that we are like him in our character. In our character we are like God, that is, his love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. That is God's character. And he has made us in that same way to be able to express that. He didn't make animals like that, didn't make rocks, trees, birds, or anything else like that. He made us like that. And the other way that we are like him is in his role, his role of ruling the world forever. So what happened on the last day of creation, God made everything he had made. He said, it is good. <clears throat> and then he said, for the last thing that we make, why don't we make a being in our image, that is, with our character and with our role in ruling the world forever. And that's who we are. That's who you are. You are a being of great purpose and dignity and reason for living for now and eternity. That's who you are. You were created with God's character to rule his world. That makes you a very, very special creation. Now, does that contrast with what we're hearing out there about what we are as human beings? Good grief. Uh, we're told in science books, we're told on TV and Internet and in classrooms and wherever we go, no, no, human beings over billions of years evolved, accidentally evolved over billions of years. You know the pile of leaves that blows up against your fence this time of year, just that accidental pile of leaves? It has no purpose, it has no dignity, it has no reason for living or being or has no future. Yeah, that's what we are if we believe in evolution. We have no purpose, we have no dignity or meaning in life, and there is no future planned out for us. That's if evolution is true. God says, that's not what I made mankind for. And in your insert, <clears throat> the first point we have in there for being made in God's image is that you, you are a being of, with enormous purpose, dignity, and reason for living for now and eternity. You. <clears throat> That's a description of you. In fact, I'd like you to say that with me this morning. Can you read this on the screen with me? Let's do, read it together. I am a being with enormous purpose, dignity, and reason for living for now and eternity. Do you feel that way about yourself? If you listen to the world, that's not at all what you are. But if you listen to God, that's what he says we are. That's what he says you are. It's a magnificent thing. Um, God wants this understanding to flow over you as you walk through the world, that this is the type of being that you are. He doesn't want you feeling inferior or you're kind of insignificant. No, you're not very smart. No, you're not very educated. You haven't risen high in the world's value system and all that. 
And so you just kind of walk around thinking, I'm just, you know, kind of a nobody, kind of a forgettable person. <laughs> That's not what God says. You're a being of enormous purpose, dignity, and reason for living. He wants that to flow over you. And not only do you have enormous dignity, but enormous responsibility that comes with that enormous responsibility. We looked at that last week, and this is also in your insert. <clears throat> Number one, to live each day ruling your world for God. Why did God create you to rule the world? So you would rule the world. And that doesn't mean the entire world, but you have a world that you move around in. God wants you not being a spect spectator, looking at the things going on at work, looking at the things going on in your family, your community. He wants you engaging them, taking hold of them, and influencing them for good. Being a leader, and not just letting others do things to society and to the workplace and to the home. You rule, get involved. That's what God made you to do. To take charge, and not just take charge in any way, but with his character. And that's the second thing in your insert, to live each day pr practicing God's character. Why did God make you able to live out his character? So you would live out his character, right? You bear the image of God. Are you bearing the image of God as you move about at home and in the community and at your job and school? God says, bear my character. Love, joy, peace, patience, and all the rest. I made you show that you would do that. And so not only are we beings of enormous purpose and dignity, but we have enormous responsibilities that come with it to rule our world for God with God's character that he has given us. Question, did you do that last week? <clears throat> That's why God created you. Did you take hold of your world and through the character of God that he has given you, take hold of your world that way that was your purpose last week and it's your purpose for this coming week make sure you are taking hold of your home and your work and your school and your community and shaping it for God with God's character that he's put in you that's your purpose that he's made you in this world well that's kind of a review of what we did last week today we're going to look at the second half <clears throat> of what bearing the image of God means and the first half meaning I am a person of enormous purpose, dignity, and reason for living. But the second half of that is that other people, and this is in your insert, other people are beings <clears throat> with enormous purpose, dignity, and reason for living <clears throat> for now and eternity. Think of the other people in your life. Okay, picture their faces in your mind. And realize they are copies of God as well. Those people that you are, interact with every day, they are also copies of God. I want to show you something. Up here on the screen, I, I have something to admit. These are not my children. No, these are not my children. This is a picture of my children. This is a copy of my children. My real children are not here today, but this is a copy of my children. And so what, you know, Pastor? Well, if I gave you a picture of my children and you took it and you spit on it, tore it in half and threw it on the floor, how do you think I'd feel? I'd be pretty angry. Well, why would you be angry, Pastor? It's just a copy. It's not your real kids. No, but the way you treat the copy is the way I'm taking that you really think of my kids. And if you want to make me pleased, you're going to treat the, the, not just my kids with respect, but a copy of them with respect. And that's exactly what God says to us um, about, well, here, let me back up. I'll leave there. I'll them on the screen. Uh, that's exactly what God says about other people in your life. God made them as copies of himself. And do you respect God? Yeah, you respect God. Then God says, I want you to respect the copies that are made in my image, which is everyone you've ever met. And particularly we have a harder time treating with respect the people that live in our own household, right? Isn't that the worst thing? You'll treat a total stranger with great respect, but the people you live with every day, it's easy to disrespect them and not treat them really well. God says, I made those people as copies of me. And the way you end up treating them is the way you're treating uh, me because I'm a copy. Um, look how God says our relation... The, the dignity in making others in this image should affect our relationship in two ways. Our relationship with others. Uh, Genesis 9. 
1 says, God blessed Noah and his sons and told them, multiply and fill the earth. Then he goes on and says in verse 5, murder is forbidden. Animals that kill people must die, and any person who murders must be killed. Yes, you must execute anyone who murders another person. Why? For to kill a person is to kill a living being made in God's image, the image of God. Here Noah and his family come out of the ark. They're given the same commands given to Adam and Eve, multiply, fill the earth, rule it. And he adds one that he didn't give to Adam and Eve, and that is don't murder other people. Don't murder other people. Why? Because they're copies of me, God says. They're very special. They're copies of me. You do not murder them. And here we find the incredible difference uh, between what the world says about you and what God says about you. The world says that you are just a high, highly evolved animal. That's all you are. God says, no, no, no. Well, you can kill animals. They're not made in my image. Now, you've got to be careful. You know, you just, just don't wantonly kill animals. But, yeah, you have permission to kill animals, but you do not have permission to kill people because people are made in my image. Animals aren't. People are. People are copies of me. And what is, the, uh, what, what, what is the consequence if you kill another person? Uh, God says it's a high crime, calling, calling for a high cost. The crime is destroying a copy of God. And the penalty is you being destroyed for destroying a copy of God. It's a high crime with a high penalty. God says you don't take the life of another person because they are copies of me. In your insert, that's the first thing that other people being made in the image God means. Number one, we are not allowed to murder people. <clears throat> it's kind of sad that you have to say this. But there are people uh, who don't view life that way. We are not allowed to view, uh, murder people because they are made in the image of God. Um, exceptions to this? Do we have exceptions to this? Yes, God does give exceptions to this in the Bible. And the basic principle is God gives permission to take a human life if you are going to protect human life. There's a couple of examples in the Bible and the Old Testament law of Moses. If someone broke into your home at nighttime and you, you know, were trying to protect your family, you end up killing them, that you are off the hook. You are not going to be uh, killed for murdering an, or killing another person because you were seeking to protect your family. So one exception is uh, you uh, can take the life of another person if you're protecting uh, your family. Number two, God gives governments the right to uh, put to death those who are hurting and uh, breaking laws in the community that would hurt other people. The government can protect its citizens if it needs to take another person's life. And then God gives nations the right to wage war in order to protect its citizens. The general rule is you do not murder another person ever except for a couple of these cases. Other than that, God says you must not kill people. You must not kill a person who is an invalid and kind of a the quote, burden on society person uh, because you know they're physically handicapped, mentally handicapped or whatever. And that's been done in the past. God says you can't do that. I certainly can't kill an unborn person in the womb. God says, human life is precious because it's a copy of me and you don't destroy copies of me. So that's one of the first limits that being made in the image of God uh, has in our relationships with others. The second one is found in James chapter 3. It says in James 3, 8, the tongue is a restless evil and full of deadly poison. Don't we know that? With it, we bless our Lord and Father, and with it, we curse men who have been made in God's likeness. It says, my brethren, these things are not to be. We would all agree that murdering people is not good. It's a terrible thing. But we are probably not feeling as strong as mistreating people. Uh, God says, you don't murder people because they're copies of me. And he also says, you don't mistreat people because they're also copies of me. And that's the second insert uh, thing. We are not allowed to mistreat people because they're copies of God. Specifically here, it uh, talks about cursing. Um, how many of you cursed God this week, last week? Probably not many of you cursed God. But God says, if you cursed at another driver on the road who was driving too slow, even under your breath, 
you were cursing God, right? Because that person is a copy of God. Uh, you curse at that person at work who's just being, uh, you know, really intolerable. Uh, you turn on the TV and see the president, and you whisper under your breath a curse at him. No, that is not appropriate. You cannot do that because no matter who that person is, they're made as an image of God, a copy of God. And what did Jesus, our king, say? He says in Matthew 25, I was hungry and you gave me nothing to eat. I was thirsty and you gave me nothing to drink. I was a stranger and you did not invite me in. I was naked and you did not clothe me. And people will say, when did we do these things to you? And he says, to the extent that you did not do it to one of the least of these, you did not do it to me. The truth is, the way we treat other people, listen, the way we treat other people lands on Jesus. It's exactly what he says. They are copies of me. You treat them badly, you end up treating me badly. Can you think of someone that you cursed at recently? Jesus says you were cursing at him. Truly. That's it. Would would you just raise your fist and curse at God? No, you wouldn't dare do that. And God says, you don't curse at someone who's a copy of me. Have you badmouthed someone recently behind their back? You badmouthed Jesus. Have you insulted someone or uh, ignored someone who is in need? Those things landed on Jesus because they are copies of him. I think we'd all agree that we have to respect God. How do you know if you respect God or not? Do you respect God? One of the ways you know if you respect God or not is how you treat people who are the copies of him. Do you, are you showing respect to your spouse or disrespect? That any disrespect lands on Jesus. Uh, children, are you respecting your parents? They're made as copies of God. Parents, your children are copies of God. Your co-worker is, your fellow church members are, your next-door neighbor is. God says, we must take that very seriously in how we relate with each other. Uh, the bad news is that every time last week you did a bad action or word against some other person, that landed on Jesus. The good news is that every good action and word also landed on Jesus. Jesus. Because they are a copy of him. How should we treat people who bear God's image with respect? With respect. We treat everybody with respect. Now what is respect? If you had to give me a definition of respect, what would you say respect is? Respect is treating another person as valuable. Okay? Respect shows how valuable a person is to you. High respect means the person is highly valuable to you. You can probably think of someone that you really, really respect, right? Think of someone that you really have great respect for. Okay, now, how do you treat them? Wow, you treat them really well. I mean, you uh, give them your full attention. You look them in the eye when they speak to you. You, you know, show that you are interested in what they're saying. You give them acknowledgement to their feelings and to their concerns. And you're right there with them as you're interacting with them. That's how you show respect to somebody. You show that you are valuing them. Uh, you say, well, yeah, but what if a person's really a jerk? I mean, they're just... the terrible jerk, and I don't like them, and they irritate me all the time, do I still have to show respect to them? Um, Are they a copy of God? Well, yeah, but they're not acting like a copy of God. Okay, they may not be acting like a copy of God, but are they a copy of God? Yeah, they are. And God says you have to show respect to them because of what they are, not how they're acting. They're a copy of God. This is what God tells us. If you value God... And then God says, you have to value the copies that are made in my image. Uh, what if a person goes beyond being a jerk and is really an enemy of God? I mean, they shake their fist at God. They're constantly disobeying God. They're bad-mouthing God. You've probably met people like that. Do you have to show respect to them? Well, what are God's feelings about a person who does that? God's feelings. 
You remember the word abomination? It's used in the Bible. We tend to forget what the word abomination means. Uh, the word abomination means repulsive and disgusting. We don't use that word very much. Although there is the abominable snowman, right? He's repulsive and disgusting. Um, imagine you're drinking a milkshake. You get down to the bottom of your milkshake. You look, and there is a spider, okay? That's, I, and I say that on purpose because uh, that's what the word abomination means. It means something repulsive and disgusting, okay? God has a whole list of things in the Bible that are abominations to him. Now, we know God hates every sin, but there are certain sins that he says rise to a level of a spider in the bottom of the milkshake for him that that literally emotionally make him utterly disgusted. Uh, This is as complete a list that I could get. Uh, Child sacrifice, that makes sense. Adultery. Homosexuality, bestiality, worshiping of the gods, divination, witchcraft, sorcery, casting spells, spelled it wrong, spiritism, necromancy, prostitution, dishonesty, pride, murder, robbery, lying, the praying of the wicked, justifying the wicked and condemning the innocent and oppressing the poor. God hates all sin, but when he sees these sins go on, it's extremely disgusting and repulsive to him. The question is, but how does God treat people who commit these things? He sent his son, his only son in the world, to die for people who do these things. While we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. All of us have gone astray. Yet the Lord has laid on Christ the sins of us all. See, God emotionally is absolutely disgusted by these things. His actions, though, his treatment is to extend love, to save us out of this type of thing. Does that love, uh, is, it, is it eternal? No. God says, I will extend my love to you, but if you will not take hold of my love, then you will have my justice. Accept Christ's love right now while he's being offered to you for the the things that you have done, the salvation that you need. Because a time will come when he says, all right, I'm withdrawing my love. You have not taken it, I'm withdrawing it, and now you will experience full justice for what you have done in this world. But God gives us a way to copy him here. God says, when you have a person in your life that is committing a horrible sin, Emotionally, you should respond like he does. This is utterly disgusting, utterly terrible, utterly repulsive. But even though your emotions are saying that, your actions, your treatment of the person must be to extend love to them. That's what God does. God extends love to those who are unlovely and unloving. And God says that's what we must do. Jesus showed his love for terrible people by serving them to the point of dying on the cross for them. And you and I must show love for the terrible people in our lives by serving them, even to the point of great cost and sacrifice. That's what he says to do. Can you think of someone that you need to treat better? That you should be treating better? That's what this whole sermon is about. It's easy to treat with respect the people we feel respect for. But the people who have hurt us, mistreat us, irritate us, then we don't treat them with respect. And God says, they're still copies of me. And you must treat them with respect. Who are people that get disrespected and mistreated in our society? Very often it's people who are different from us. The people who are different. So you have a person with a different skin color, and it's, I hate blacks, I hate Asians. And there's many people who hate whites, different skin color. How about a different nationality? I hate Russians, I hate Iranians, and many people hate Americans. How about different states? I hate New Yorkers, I hate Californians. (laughs) Uh, How about a political party? I hate Democrats. And many people hate Republicans. Uh, How about different sexes? I hate men. I hate women. 
How about families? I hate the Joneses. Every single one of them, they're just terrible people. Uh, how about different religions? I hate Muslims. I hate Jews. We're hearing a lot about that. I hate atheists. And many people hate Christians. And how about sexual orientations? I hate lesbians. I hate gays. I hate bisexuals. I hate transsexuals. What does God think about hating people made in his image? Even though they act in ways they shouldn't act, God says they're still copies of God. And if we, he expects us to treat him with respect. He says, I want you to show respect to copies made in my image. Do you know the people you are tempted to disrespect and mistreat, that those, the, of those, any of those categories that I just said? Because you need to know what your old nature is going to tempt you who, to hate. And maybe your old nature screens for you to hate one of the groups I just mentioned. You need to know what your old nature is going to tempt you to, to, tempt you to do. And then number two, you need to kill that every single time it comes up. Every single time your old nature tells you to hate one of the groups I just mentioned, you need to kill it and say, no, I'm obeying God. They're made in his image. That person with a different skin color, doesn't matter. Get out of here. I'm going to show them respect. And think about it. God gave them their skin color. And you're going to hate them for their skin color? That's a good choice of God made. You're directly hating something that he created and did. And it might not be skin color. It might be sex. It might be political party. It might be, you know, family they came from, their nationality that they have. God says, when temptation comes to hate another person for one of these things, kill it. That's not your new nature. That's the old sinful nature that used to be a part of you, but you're a child of God who's been born again with God's nature, made in God's image, called to live out God's character. So kill that immediately. There's no excuse for it to exist even for one second. But it exists all around us. Yes, a person's sin is supposed to emotionally cause us to be you know, angry. Sin should make us angry. But the emotions and the treatment of another person are different. We treat each other with respect, with respect, because we're made in, each, uh, in the image of God. That means we need to shake ourselves when we're dealing with people that irritate us or bother us or that we you know, are, are sinful and doing things that are outrageous. We need to shake ourselves and make sure we treat them with respect. Now, the, again, there's a difference between treating a person with respect and having a respect for a person. Having means you truly feel respect inside your heart. I really respect that person. But even if you don't have that feeling in your heart, God says you treat the person with respect anyway. You know, you look them in the eye, you acknowledge their feelings, you listen and give them the opportunity to speak and to talk and to acknowledge what they're going through. You treat them as a being worthy of respect, even though they may not be worthy of respect. That's what God says to do. That's what he does with us. Respecting, respect is treating people as valuable. Suppose you were going through a yard sale, and you pull up, you start looking through the different boxes that are in, in the person's yard, and you come across a little box with a whole bunch of twisted metal in it, old, broken, twisted metal, and you say, what in the world is this? And they say, I have no idea. We just found it in our basement. We thought if someone wanted it for scrap or something. And you decide to take it. You take it to an antique dealer, and they say, you know what this is? This is one of the ancient crowns of the, one of the kings of England. God says the people in your life are crowns, broken crowns, broken copies of God, who we must all treat with great respect. Every single one of us in here is a broken copy of God. We're not quite restored to what we should be, but God is working on that if you're a Christian. And we need to be very patient and respectful of each other because we're all going to misbehave. We're all going to do dumb things. And it's easy to be disrespectful and mistreat each other. God says, don't do that. That person looks like me. And what you do to them lands on me. That means we need to watch how we treat each other. 
Think of a person who's mistreated you. It shouldn't be hard. Are you treating them with respect? I don't mean do you feel respect for them, but are you treating them with respect? God says, I expect you to do that. Do you need to ask God for forgiveness for mistreating anybody made in his image? When we close a prayer, do that. Tell God you're sorry. Do you need to recommit yourself to giving respect to people who aren't living worthy of respect? Do that too when we pray in a minute. Genesis 1 takes us back to the foundations of, of everything. And it teaches us how to treat ourselves and, our other, and other people. Remember, you, it teaches us, you are a being with enormous purpose, dignity, and reason for living now and eternally. View yourself that way as you walk through society, as you interact with people. You are incredibly valuable. But also remember, everyone you know is also in the same category. And that must shape the way you treat them. I was thinking about this this week as I was moving about and, and seeing other people and how sad it is when you see someone whose life is just in, totally in the wrong lane as far as God's concerned. Maybe they're a junkie or maybe they are, are, are just, they're, they're, they're looking for answers in all the wrong places and their lives are just totally messed up. God tells us these people are supposed to be beautiful crowns in this world. And just let your heart break for them because they're so far away from what God created them to be. And let your heart reach out to them. Pray for them. Do whatever you can to, to, to help them, pull them to what God created them to be. And let that include yourself. If, you, if Satan's giving you lies about yourself and how you're not worth anything, just kill those lies every time they come into your mind. God says you're enormously valuable. And you have a great future. You're made with God's character to rule the world. Live this way and treat other people this way. But Genesis 1 gives us such an important foundation for all the rest of life. If you need to be treating someone better, let this be a sermon that rouses you to do that. It won't be easy, but rouse yourself, shake yourself to treat them as a copy of God. Treat them with respect because they look like him.